Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2013 Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce uh, Forum Onslow. Uh, on behalf of the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Committee, myself, Matt Ray, the division chairman, would like to thank you all for being here. Those in attendance, those live on G10, and a, a special thank you to our candidates for taking time out this evening for for some Q&A. We do ask that you do turn off all of your cell phones this evening and uh, all, all questions be presented in a, in a cordial manner. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to our corporate sponsor with Ms. Millie Chalk. Good evening, my name's Millie Chalk and on behalf of Duke Energy, we wanna welcome you to Forum Onslow. Duke Energy is proud to partner with the Jacksonville Daily News and the Chamber's Governmental Affairs Committee in sponsoring this forum focused on candidates running for Jacksonville City Council. In this turbulent and uncertain world we live in, we recognize voting is a privilege and being an informed voter is our responsibility. So I look forward to an informational session this evening as our candidates outline their priorities for the City of Jacksonville. Duke Energy is proud to sponsor Four Monslow and is proud to provide clean, safe, and reliable energy to Jacksonville and Onslow County. Now on to the candidates. Elliot? Okay, thank you very much. Our candidates, we want to thank you for participating in this evening's program. Um, tonight we have the candidates for the Jacksonville City Council. We have uh, candidates for two at-large seats, as well as the candidates for Ward 2 seats. Um, in recent years, I think you will agree that we've seen a surge of interest in local government and uh, people have come to understand once again that I didn't turn the microphone on in time, <laughs> as usual. I tell Glenn to always have that thing on before I start because I never forget to remember that. But in any case, people have come, there has been a surge of interest in our local government because people have come to understand uh, that the decisions made by our locally elected bodies really have sometimes have a greater impact on their lives than maybe some decisions we see made in, in Raleigh and Washington. Um, so we appreciate uh, your attendance here and we appreciate uh, those people in the audience who are here to participate. Um, these forums have become something of a rite of passage. The staff of uh, the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce uh, particularly Janet Bowen, they put a lot of work into these. We, we do a lot of work into making these a success in terms of uh, fairness, participation, and the information that we hope to provide. Uh, I'm joined at the table by another member of the chamber staff, uh, Christina Fernandez, who will help us tonight with our timekeeping. Uh, we hope to make this a very useful and productive evening for the candidates and voters alike, but I'd like to spend a few moments first going over the rules. First, a few items for those in attendance. As uh, Mr. Ray uh, explained uh, and asked you, if you haven't already, please silence your cell phones and other mobile devices. We also ask that you refrain from applause until the program has been completed. We do have ways for the audience to participate, at least during this live presentation. The folks in the audience and those watching at home on G10 are welcome to participate by sending questions during the forum to G10 events at ci.jacksonville.nc.us or you can tweet them to at G10 events. Those of you who are in attendance, you may have already seen these cards that we passed out. Uh, you can write your questions on these cards and uh, pass them out to a, or the, the chamber representative. Uh, if you will raise your hand, a chamber representative will be by to collect them. We hope to use as many of these questions as we can, but, but we've kind of altered the format tonight. Um, so we, we, we we're going to have just a, a really a, probably a select few uh, that we can choose from. Um, because we only have uh, five candidates participating tonight, smaller field than we usually deal with in these forums, um, we're going to, we are going to use a different format. Uh, it's straightforward with one small deviation. We will ask each of you a series of general questions questions and rotate the order in which you will respond. You will have 60 seconds to answer each question. We will not have the traditional fishbowl round in this, this one. We would just ask all general questions throughout the evening. Here's the wrinkle and something new that we're trying this time. Each of you have been given two rebuttal cards uh, that you can use during the questioning. One is for 30 seconds, one is for 15 seconds. 
at the conclusion of each round of questions, that means after everybody here has gone through their uh, answers, you will be you can raise one of your rebuttal cards and uh, you can use it if you would like to add to your answer or perhaps address one of the points that's been raised in the course of, uh, of the answers that were given by the candidates. You can only use one rebuttal card per question, and I'll try, as I explained earlier, to stick to the original order of questioning in calling on you to respond. So I urge you to use your rebuttal cards wisely. Um, my goal is to ask questions for about an hour, so plan accordingly. At the end, we'll have summations, uh, one minute for the closing remarks. I ask that you remember our basic rules. This is a forum, not a debate. We ask that you address the questions that have been posed to you and not each other. Even during the rebuttals, we ask that you stick to the issues that have been raised. We also ask that you adhere to our time limits. When you see a yellow light during the one minute round, that will signal that you have 30 seconds to complete your response. When the clock goes to double zeros and you see the red light, we ask for you to complete your sentence that you're on and then stop. We want to be fair to everyone, so I will interrupt if necessary to enforce the time limits. Are there any questions from the candidates? Okay, if not, uh, we'll get started. And I will start to my, to my left, Mr. Eatman. You'll be first up, and uh, here's the question. Please provide us with some basic biographical information, including your name, your occupation, your neighborhood or street of residence, and how long you have lived in the city. And follow this by answering this question. What do you feel qualifies you for a seat on the Jacksonville City Council? Alex Eatman. Well, I've been in town the last 11 years. I'm 22 years old, so I've spent a, a good half of my life here. Um, I went to Coastal for accounting. I got a two-year degree from there. I've been uh, knocking on doors all over town, and I've been getting a connection, I think, with individual voters all, through, all throughout the city. I'm not the type of guy that, you know, puts up signs and everything. I've been listening to what the people want to see. I think that that qualifies me to be a member of the city council. Um, people, you know, talk to me more than they uh, cower in fear, so to speak, at uh, monolithic government titles. Um, I'm just a neighbor, basically. Uh, I live over on Dennis Road. I've been talking to all my neighbors. I've been talking to people all over town. And they're liking what they're hearing and I'm liking what I'm hearing from them. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. I'll repeat the question for you. Um, we're asking that you provide your name uh, and some base, along with some basic biographical information, such as your occupation, uh, your neighborhood or street of residence, how long you've lived in the city. And uh, please follow by answering this question. What do you feel qualifies you for a seat on the Jacksonville City Council? Okay, thank you, Elliot. Uh, my name is Randy Thomas. I live at 201 Deborah Place. I am an Oslo County native. I graduated from Jacksonville Senior High School, class of 1972. I have a business administration degree from the University of North Carolina, class of 76. I've been married to my wife, Kathy, for 27 years. I have three children, Bethany, 26, Andrew, 24, Anna, 22. Um, I've primarily been self-employed my entire life, my working life, work with family business, small business. I have served six years on the city council and uh, my qualifications are just my life experience. I've been more or less a lifelong resident. I've seen the town grow, evolve, and want to contribute to its continued growth. Thank you. Mr. Ward. You're not going to repeat the question to me? Well, if you'd like for me to, I surely will. I've got it. I got this one. Um, I'm Bob Warden. Um, I'm a native. Mildred Thomas signed my, my birth certificate many years ago. I came here because of the Marine Corps, graduate of uh, Jacksonville High School in 1970, NC State uh, in 75. I'm married to uh, Miss Lynn, former Bowman. We've got two children, two wonderful grandsons. Uh, we enjoy living here in Alonzo County. I live at 1006 Clyde Drive, which is part of the Forest Hills, Northwoods, Northwoods Park area of town, uh, actually five, five houses down from the Jacksonville High School. I've uh, served 15 years on the planning board, 
Before that, I was six years on the, the Water and Sewer Advisory Board. Based on that 21 years of working in the, in the city behind the scenes with the, with the advisory committees, I, I decided I wanted to run last time. I've served four years on the council, and uh, hopefully the, what, what I've done over the last four years is, is enough to entice somebody to vote for me again. Thank you. Thank you. We will move now to the candidates for the uh, Ward 2 seat. Um, Mr. Bittner. Good evening. I'm Jerry Bittner. I uh, arrived here in Jacksonville in 1987, was appointed as city manager, following a city manager positions in three other communities. I have an undergraduate degree in political science and business administration, and a master's in governmental administration from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Government, fortunately or unfortunately, has been my career. I finished my formal city manager tour of duty here in 1999 and retired and thought Jacksonville was as good a place to live as I could find because I had fallen in love with the community. Um, I love this community. I have a lot of experience in government and civic affairs, been involved in service clubs, helped assist some of the boards and commissions here in Jacksonville, been involved in a lot of the growth issues facing Jacksonville over the years. And I think my experience, my knowledge of the community, my love for the community, uh, it's my reasons for continuing to want to work to improve Jacksonville to make it a better place for all of us concerned. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Williams. Thank you, sir. I've been here four years. I moved here four years ago with my wife, Alice, to be closer to our four grandchildren. I'm probably one of the only people that actually chose Jacksonville as a residence, as opposed to being assigned uh, to the military here or being born here. I live in the Jacksonville Commons at 929 Commons Drive North. My occupation currently is as a photographer. In the past, though, I'm a retired criminal investigator. My last assignment was a Deputy Inspector General for the Los Angeles Unified School District's Inspector General's Office. I've got 30 years of criminal investigative and uh, oversight experience. Uh, that I think qualifies me uh, to uh, be on the council. Uh, the council position as I see it is an oversight position to guide or to provide guidance to the employees uh, of the city. And I think I'm uh, more than qualified to do that. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll start this round of questions with Mr. Thomas and then move uh, to my right and to his left. And, uh, and then we'll go back to you, Mr. Eatman. Um, Mr. Thomas, what do you see as Jacksonville's greatest asset and its biggest deficiency? For me personally, our greatest asset is our locale, our geographic location, the climate, the landscape, the water. I mean, obviously, economically, the base uh, affords us our economic base. That's our greatest physical asset. And what was the second part? It, I'm asking, in addition to the greatest asset, what is the biggest deficiency? Uh, the, the deficiency I hear the most, I guess, is, is lack of opportunity, lack of industry. Again, I think that goes back to our geographic location. We're not exactly ideal for centralized location of any type of major industry. Um, our dependence on the military, I guess, is the two sides of every coin. You know, our greatest asset is the military, but we have a almost complete dependence on them. So that is, in effect, a weakness. Mr. Warden. I think I would agree with, uh, with Mr. Thomas. I think our greatest asset, of course, is, is the base. We weathered the Great Recession better than most communities throughout the United States, and, and we, we owe that, that entirely to the, to the base. Uh, the base construction, uh, the military, uh, this base, Camp Lejeune, actually uh, provided work for a lot of folks who came here. Our, our population increased. <clears throat> Probably our greatest weakness is, is our lack of, of uh, work, manufacturing work. Uh, we've got a lot of service work here available. We have a lot of uh, uh, opportunities on the base. I don't know what that future is going to hold. I think under the, cu the cutbacks that are being proposed, I think 
we may see some, some of that opportunities go away. So I would like to see us a little less dependent upon the base, um, but it's just going to take time. Mr. Bittner. Well, I think some of the advantages of Jacksonville, is, as mentioned, is our locale, our proximity to the beach, the wealth of talent we have, people who have retired from the military with a wide range of talents, many of them who have ascended into leadership positions in the community. Uh, our disadvantage, and I'll echo Mr. Warden's comments, is the lack of a diversified economy. Our economy, as everyone knows, is based primarily on the military, and that's been great from the standpoint of us withstanding the, the pitfalls of a rising economy and a recessions. But uh, we've got to try to do more to diversify our economy and keep our kids who graduate from college good reasons for coming back here and finding a job and staying, or staying around with their families here. Mr. Williams, what do you see as a Jacksonville's greatest asset and its biggest deficiency? I would have to echo probably what the other candidates have already said with regards to the availability of uh, people coming from the base. Uh, the, the base has a uh, plethora of uh, individuals assigned to it, a lot of dependent wives, et cetera, that work. But primarily what we have here is a service industry. We've got a lot of hotels, we've got a lot of restaurants and stuff like that. We have no small business or medium-sized businesses that could draw or retain the people that come here. The military spends a lot of time and effort into training these people out there on the base and in other bases, and when they eventually end up here, whether they've done four years or whether they've done 20 or 30 years, if they're looking to establish themselves in the local economy here, it's very difficult to do that because we don't have enough diversified bases here with regards to uh, large or, or medium-sized businesses that can attract them to stay in the local area. The other major problem that I see that we have is a uh, we're number 40, number 44 uh, currently in the uh, business tax climate here. Thank you. Mr. Eatman. Uh, to echo what the other candidates had said, the base essentially is our uh, main strength and weakness. We are too dependent upon the base, I think, but at the same time, that's given rise to a very strong culture of service. Now, whether that's food service, we've had a lot of uh, new restaurants cropping up recently, uh, new hotels as well, at least two of them on Western Boulevard alone, or military service, which is, of course, you know, the backbone of the economy here. Um, people in Jacksonville are more geared towards that kind of thing. Um, we've got the USO not too far from here, and United Way is headquartered uh, just around the corner, pretty much. Um, so Jacksonville is a very service-oriented and a very giving kind of community. At the same time, uh, like the others have said, we don't have much in the way of industry here. We don't uh, produce as much as certain other towns would. For me, though, I think that that probably shouldn't be our uh, main focus. That it shouldn't be seen as something that we should try to cover up. It's something more that we should embrace. We should remain a community that's welcoming to the military so we don't have that, uh, you know, acting as a weakness rather than a strength. Thank you. Um, are there any rebuttals? <laughs> okay, I just want to remind you that you have that opportunity uh, with those two cards that are in your hand. Uh, Mr. Warden, we'll start this round of questioning off with you, and I'll ask, uh, how would you assess the current state of relations between our city and our county governments? What areas of local government do you see as being ripe for greater cooperation? I would say that uh, the, the city uh, the city council stands willing and ready to cooperate with the county on, on any project that, that's a win-win for both, both parties. Uh, and that, that holds true for any group. Uh, the city has done a lot of uh, public-private partnerships and primarily uh, working downtown, trying to redevelop the downtown area, for example. Um, we're, that relationship with the county could always be better. Uh, there's there's been a couple little things in the past, but but a good uh, a good public servant does not let personalities does not let issues stand in the way of of, of getting in, uh, getting in the way of the number one primary goal, and that's to make sure that we serve the citizens and the taxpayers of Onslow County and Jacksonville, and will the city council will continue to work and seek out partnerships with the county that make make good sense. Thank you. Mr. Bittner? I want to repeat that question. I sure please. will. 
Um, how would you assess the current state of relations between our city and county governments? And what areas of local government do you see as being ripe for greater cooperation? Well, I'd say the relations are a little strained right now because of the cutback in the sales tax distribution formula, which has hurt Jacksonville greatly and which was done primarily behind closed doors. But be that as it may, I think there's a recognition on this part of the council and myself that what's good for Onslow County is also good for Jacksonville. Jacksonville people are taxpayers for Onslow County. So if we have joint projects, we all benefit. Uh, we haven't let some of the strained relationships affect some of these projects that will be of benefit to both taxpayers. For example, we're involved in a multi-million dollar uh, 800 megahertz radio system with Onslow County that will assist our first responders in two terms of doing even a better job. We participated with Onslow County and the state of North Carolina in getting the funding for a Jacksonville landing, a new boat ramp facility down by the bridges that will be under construction next year. So we follow the philosophy of what's good for Onslow County can also be good for Jacksonville, and we seek out those kind of partnerships. Thank you. Mr. Williams. I'm going to take a little bit of a diverse uh, there. Uh, I, I don't see any good cooperation between the two uh, from an outsider standpoint. I think communication can always be improved, but I think you have to reach across the aisle in order to do that. I think there's enough blame to go around, but I don't know that it takes blame in order to fix the problem. The county and the city need to work together. We're all in the same thing. We have the same constituents. Our citizens of Jacksonville are part of the county. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to work together in a better thing. I don't know the history. I've only been here for four years. But in the last four years, I have seen so much divisiveness between the county and the city with the different projects. And Burton Park is one of the areas that we could get greater cooperation. Downtown uh, redistricting or downtown redevelopment could also be another area. Uh, I don't understand why we're tearing down a jail and putting gravel on the site and simply going to leave it that way when that could be a joint project in here. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Eatman, we'll go down to you now. And the question is, how would you assess the current state of relations between our city and county governments? What areas of local government do you see as being ripe for greater cooperation? Well, certainly the sales tax de uh, decision recently uh, like Bob Williams said, you know, demonstrates the decisiveness, the, the, the divisiveness uh, between the city and the county government. I can't really say that um, the cooperation that we've seen in certain projects necessarily is the best thing. Um, Mr. Bittner brought up that we're cooperating with the county on um, at Jacksonville Landing downtown that boat ramp is going to come at the cost of uh, three different businesses, and it already has. Um, the city claimed eminent domain on that land, and it wound up shutting down those three businesses. Uh, two of them have shut down and not opened up. A third one reopened way out in the county, driving jobs away from Jacksonville. Um, the county is, of course, going to chip in, I think, one or $200,000 to build this boat ramp, but right now all we've got sitting down there is an ugly pile of dirt instead of, you know, jobs and everything. Um, Right now, the county and city haven't really been doing much of a good job of representing the people's interest in terms of that kind of cooperation. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Well, obviously, our level of cooperation is between the city and the council is, is not at a peak at this time. We've had some rough patches, some decisions they've made that we didn't agree with. We expressed our disagreement. You know, that being said, city, county, I don't think people on the council, I know personally, I can't feel any different about a neighbor that happens to live on one side of Ramsey Road or the other side of Ramsey Road. You know, we're all in this together. It's much like a family. You don't get to choose your family except your spouse. I mean, there's one chance. There again, there's going to be issues within family. It's going to go high. It's going to go low. I'm hopeful that... Um, through outreach and cooperation, we can improve those relations. We do have a lot of good things going together. We're working the city water sewer with Onwasa with the base to do some joint things we wouldn't be able to do together. So there, there are definite opportunities for improvement. 
Okay. Once again, I'll offer a chance for rebuttal, but without that, I'll move on. Um, and we'll start this round of questioning with Mr. Bittner. Uh, what do you see as the most pressing issue that faces the city in terms of public safety? And uh, how can you as a council member address that concern? In a matter of public safety, like I said, we're moving toward an advanced 800 megahertz radio system, which will improve the communication between the officers and first responders, all facilitating their ability to make quick and timely responses. Uh, public safety, uh, traffic congestion is also one of our major concerns. And with the new construction of the uh, public safety building, we will have headquartered in that building a traffic control system that will end up having all the traffic lights computerized throughout the city to facilitate movement of the traffic as quickly as possible by timing and coordinating these traffic signals which will also be used to facilitate first responders so basically that's it thank you mr williams thank you I think probably the, the most pressing issue with public safety, in my view, and I come from a law enforcement standpoint, would be uh, some of the uh, different homicides and uh, crimes against people that we're seeing in the city. I don't know, necessarily know that it's going up, but there is, over the last four years, significant number of uh, issues that we've had in that area. Most of those have revolved around uh, the young Marines uh, coming from the base. I think maybe we need to partner a little bit more with our social services departments and the military in order to try to get some more education, more counseling out there on the base if they, they need assistance from us, uh, maybe some more uh, training. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Marines that are coming back from uh, tours over in Afghanistan and previously in Iraq. Uh, it's been a protracted war over there for many, many years, and we've got people going back and forth on a number of occasions. And I think that uh, the fatigue has just set in, and uh, I think we could work better uh, with the military to try to resolve that issue. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Eatman, we'll move to you, and I will repeat the question for you. What do you see as the most pressing issue facing the city in terms of public safety, and how could you as a council member address that concern? Right now that's split. Um, as Mr. Williams brought up, the Marines basically, they bring in um, a lot of that. They have um, been deployed, you know, overseas and everything. And then they come back here. I've heard from people that have been in the Army station in Iraq um, that they have a hard time readjusting. You know, they don't have to be afraid of IEDs on the side of the road in Jacksonville and everything. Um, another half of that, which is more common throughout the country, is the fact that people have brought up that uh, certain kind of environments in the household breed crime and um, malicious intent. That kind of thing we're not going to be able to fix uh, with the wave of a magic wand. This isn't the kind of thing that the government can even fix. This is the kind of thing that people need to fix. We need to get to know our neighbors a little bit better. Uh, we need to be stronger as a community. Uh, I look to churches as being an example of that. They usually are very uh, tight-knit. Um, the crime problem is one that we're only going to be able to uh, counter the ones that have already happened with government. But as far as preventing crime and lowering the incidence of it, we're going to need to do that as individual citizens. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. To me, on a general level, the biggest issue is as far as a general safety aspect is the traffic that we have to bear in Jacksonville. The increased activity on the roads has been alleviated some by the additional roads, but unfortunately, with the youth-oriented culture that we have here, we have some very inexperienced drivers. We have uh, a police force that is proactive. They are out there. Uh, citing people that are violating speed limits and such, but to me it's been astounding just the number of vehicle accidents that are in this, that occur inside Jacksonville. On one positive aspect, something that I've noticed over the past few years, um, as far as safety that we've done well with is pedestrian safety. For years, I remember it was not uncommon for a pedestrian to be killed in an accident. We've done a lot of improvements on Western major intersections to provide safe passage for people on foot. Thank you. And Mr. Warden. Thanks, sir. Uh, 
since I've been on council, this council, this last four years, have added uh, several police officers. We've added several firefighters. Uh, we've, we made a commitment to the citizens of Jacksonville that we would be proactive in, in public safety. As Randy mentioned, uh, we actually uh, uh, work with DOT in getting several crosswalks, pedestrian safety throughout Jacksonville. Western Boulevard is a very good example. Unfortunately, there was a, there was a death fatality there. Uh, we're working now with, with uh, Jacksonville High School, getting ready to do some, some pedestrian safety there. Uh, also, we're building a new fire station too to increase the coverage area of Fire Station 2 and increase the response time. We've also um, encouraged and, and authorized our firefighters to be first responders. They are now the ones that are showing up with EMT training, defibrillators, and so forth as first responders to, to make sure people are, are safe at home. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll uh, go to Mr. Williams and um, I'm sorry, Mr. Bittner, I forgot to ask this time, and there you are with your card. Is that the one-minute card or the 30-second? The 30 30-second one. Second okay, go ahead. I can't say hello in 15 seconds. <laughs> Our police department and fire department, in fact, they've recently been merged for economical reasons into one public safety department. There are crimes in every major city in the United States, and I, but I would bet that our crime rate is probably lower than most communities in North Carolina. I think we have an excellent police department, an excellent chief, and we've done a great job in clearing some of these crimes that have plagued us. Uh, certainly we're not perfect, but we're human, and we have human beings living in this town, and some of them are subject to going off in a wrong direction. Thank you, sir. And appreciate your timely use of a card. <laughs> First ever. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Williams, um, what we're going to do this time is start with Mr. Williams. We're going to reverse the flow as well. So, um, and you also get the first question that we have submitted by an audience member. Good. Uh, it has to do with small business, and it begins with an example. Many small business people get charged on their monthly bills for the minimum water sewer usage, which is 2,000 gallons. Many only use 300 to 500 gallons because they do not run clothes washers or take showers or do dishes at their business. What, and uh, the question is, what can you do to help small businesses if elected? Well, it just so happens that I have uh, heard this complaint as well uh, about the sewer charges here in the uh, city. And uh, it happened uh, before I came to the city, I believe. And I'm not sure how many years it's been going on. But it is a pet peeve, I know, uh, with a lot of people, especially small businesses. With regards to what I would do, is uh, I would sit down with the uh, committee and, uh, and talk with them a little bit about this and see if we can't come up with a more equitable. In my opinion, if you're charging more for the sewer system than what you're using, it's a tax. It's a tax, plain and simple. You can call it a fee, you can call it an overcharge for over whatever, but in my opinion, it's a tax, and it's a tax that's been pushed through by the council probably at one point for whatever reason. Now, I understand that it may have been pushed through for the purpose of, uh, of simply uh, being able to do outward reach for further development and growth, but uh, I would definitely uh, look at it again. Thank you. Mr. Bittner. The scenario you draw is somebody's a small business only using 300 gallons a month, is that? Uh, the, the, the question was uh, many only use 300 to 500 gallons. So that uh, so this question says because they only do a limited amount of work or uh, water usage at their businesses. Well, the water structure is based on building blocks. The more you use, uh, different rates re rates apply. That's so unusual. I'm not sure, not sure I have an answer. My in my situation when I don't have an answer like that, we have an excellent city manager that I would sit down with and have him examine that situation. <coughs> and see if it needs redressed in some shape, manner, or form. But certainly, we'd like to see small businesses prosper, and if something like that is holding somebody back, it needs to be looked into. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Well, I would answer this a little differently. There is a, an overhead cost, a fixed cost, of, of maintaining the, the water and sewer plants that we have here in, in Jacksonville. 
In addition, we, we have to put in new lines. We have to make sure that we have redundancy. We have to replace old lines. We have to plan for growth. There's a, there's a lot of overhead that, that has to be recouped from that. In addition, there is the use of the water, and we're just like the electric company, Millie, uh, in that we charge for, for the use of water. But that water charges are for, should be just for recouping the expense of providing that water that they're using. But it does not cover the, the fixed assets that we've got in the ground, the fixed assets that we have in the land treatment system the fixed assets that we have in the new water treatment system that we recently brought on board. So um, the, the weight rate structure is, is based on all of those factors. Mr. Thomas. Well, as the uh, council liaison to the Water Sewer Advisory Committee, I've <laughs> definitely heard this complaint. Uh, my wife and I for 16 years operated a small business on Western Boulevard, and when you have essentially one bathroom, you're just not going to get to the minimum 2,000 gallons per month. That being said, we're faced, and, and homeowners have the same thing. There's a lot of single people that don't use the 2,000 gallons that the minimum rate allows. Again, that being said, we're stuck in a, a catch-22. We do, and we sincerely encourage conservation. Unfortunately, if we structured our rates to reward total conservation, as Wilmington did, we could end up like Wilmington where they did not generate enough revenue, they had to raise their rates. So we have a solid, financially sound water sewer system that is doing a lot for the city, not just the water bills, but I understand the situation, but I don't see a remedy. Okay. And Mr. Eatman. Uh, in my uh, various travels across town in Jacksonville, going door to door and speaking with citizens, they've made it quite clear that they do not like that uh, minimum usage on their water bill. Um, that kind of thing I would very much like to get rid of. Uh, if I'm elected, that'll be an automatic vote to get rid of that uh, coming from me. I don't believe that the city should charge people for something that they're not receiving and that would fall under that. Uh, Mr. Williams said that um, it's a tax whenever you get your water bill and you have to pay for something you didn't receive. That is a tax, and we have multiple taxes on our water bill. We have that storm water. I believe it's a $5 charge for that and another $10 charge for sanitation that are hidden uh, in our water bill that we pay every month. Um, I think that that's not the way to structure our water bills. I think that those kind of things need to be taken off of there. Um, those kinds of things can be... Uh, financed by the sales taxes we take in and the property taxes we take in and other forms of uh, revenue that the city has. We do not need to tax people on their water bill for that. Thank you. Now, okay, we have a, a, a plethora of cards, as oh, they okay. like to say. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm going to wait. I'm going to listen to his, his before. I, you know, I'm going to play my No, no, play. I think what we said is we're going to go into the original order here, so that would be you first, Mr. Warden. All right, I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and use it. Um, the, the water bill, the reason why we, we put the, the sanitation and the stormwater on the water bill is because it is the most economical and efficient and best way to get that billing out to the folks. Um, they're, they're, they're not necessarily taxes, they're really uses. That sanitation, for example, helps pay the, reimburse the county for landfill charges. The stormwater is a mandate from the, from, the, from the state that we have to manage our, storm, our own storm water now. They're no longer doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? I just wanted to mention that um, in the six years that I've been on the council, the city of Jacksonville Water Sewer Department, which is an enterprise fund that has to completely fund itself, has invested $40 million in a water treatment plant that was mandated by the state, essentially. We have about $45 million in additional sewer capacity that we've taken on, that we've expanded the sewer, we've acquired this, acquired the debt, we've taken on the debt, and this debt must be serviced. Um, again, we could, we could lower the rates and find ourselves in a shortfall and have to raise the rates again. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll the next question now, we'll go to Mr. Bittner, and we will move to um, my left, Mr. Bittner's right. 
What is your vision for the improvement of the downtown area? Well, I think we make an, we've made great inroads in what we have accomplished with the downtown area and will continue to do so. I think the advent of the Criminal Justice Center in the county has kept some businesses, employees there to service the service-oriented uh, businesses for the employees. The new police public safety building will do likewise. We've engaged in partnerships with local developers to build homes and offer them to low and moderate income people. We facilitated a demolition of old structures and uh, all told I think with the advent of the Riverwalk Park we've made a far better environment for facilitating economic development than what's existed before and I hope that the city can continue to play a part in terms of spurring and part partnering with other private developers in continuing that development. Thank you. Mr. Warden. The city has taken the lead on trying to redevelop the downtown area, but we're, we realize that we can't do it ourselves. We've torn down, as Mr. Bittner says, many dilapidated structures. By doing so, besides improving the appearance, we've also improved the public safety downtown. We've invested in the Riverwalk Park. So many times, private uh, developers want to see the city or whatever the municipality invest in a downtown area before they're willing to, to do so. They've seen our commitment. We, we've tore down the old Beecham building, uh, the old uh, Hopkins building. We've torn down somewhere around 10 to, to 12 houses. But we've also partnered with private developers in building houses downtown. And we hope that the majority of the redevelopment that will occur in the future will be because of the good start that we've got and that this will be private, private development um, and public partnerships where, where appropriate. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Tell me again. Um, yeah, you, I'll, the question again was, what is your vision for the improvement of the downtown area? Well, as been mentioned before, the the recent improvements are, are, have done a great deal to improve it. I think downtown is a lot like a, a diamond in the rough. You know, it's got all the components to be successful, but you've got to kind of shave away at the unsightly edges and make it a conducive environment for redevelopment, which we have done. Um, there's water sewer available. There's uh, the partnerships you mentioned. The Jacksonville Landing, I think, will be a, a boon to the area. I think it'll bring more people than, than we've seen in a long time to visit the downtown. And hopefully after that, then businesses will be attracted. There again, I think it's going to take a special type of business to succeed downtown. It's going to take a special amount of creativity of, of a type of organic because uh, a big developer's not going to come to town. They're going to do the traffic analysis and they're not going there. But somebody that's looking for a, a fresh start, they can start on the shoestring maybe with something artistic, uh, health-related, something like that. Got a lot of potential. Thank you. Mr. Eatman. Could you repeat the question? I sure will. What is your vision for the improvement of the downtown area? My vision is whatever the uh, property owners would like to have done with it. That's uh, a pretty self-explanatory kind of thing. I don't think that the city or any other level of government should try to centrally plan the development of any kind of area. I think that whoever owns that particular property, and if the city does own, which I would uh, like to assume that it does, if it does own properties, that it can develop that as it sees fit. But um, as far as the city trying to mold any section of town into a, a certain direction, I would not want to see that happen. Mr. Williams? Thank you. Alex has kind of a, the right idea, I think. He's going in the right direction there. I don't believe that uh, public monies ought to be spent for private development. Now, partnerships are always good, perhaps, if you can get the public and private there. I don't think that I should have a vision for downtown. I think the citizens of Jacksonville should have a vision for downtown, and they should bring that to us and let us know what they'd like to see. I've heard a lot about uh, from the city of what the city uh, planners and the city manager and uh, the city uh, council would like to do with the downtown, and I see what their plan is. I took a tour uh, downtown and heard what the downtown development plan is. 
I haven't heard anything from the citizens of Jacksonville whether or not there was any participatory uh, input from them to determine what they want to see downtown. Personally, I'd like to see a nice little river uh, community down there where you could go down and have a nice little meal on the river and stuff like that. But I think it takes a private developer, maybe with the assistance of the public, to uh, help. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we're going to, um, I'm going to go to another audience question, Mr. Ward. We have a card. Seconds. We have a 15-second card, Mr. Bittner. The master plan for development of the downtown area, I have to point out, was done not by city planners per se. It was done by community planning groups of citizens com living in that area with the opportunity of people f throughout the community participating in what they wanted to see in the downtown area. It wasn't done just by government per se. Thank you. And now we'll go to Mr. Warden. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you see the city and Onwasa competing for the same customers? And is this a waste of taxpayers' dollars? Potentially they could compete, but uh, we're, we're trying hard not to. Uh, we are cooperating with Onwasa and the base along the Piney Green area, but we've got an agreement as to where Onwasa is going to go and where the city is going to go so that we will not compete we do ne definitely do not want to compete with each other. There's no reason to. Um, on the other hand, uh, we, made, we made some sewer available to uh, Burton Park. Uh, Onwasa has decided that they wanted to spend money, the, their ratepayers' money. Uh, we offered it basically to them at no cost. They decided that they wanted to spend and, and invest in a, in a <coughs> treatment plant. So, uh, but you're right, uh, or whoever sent the question is, you're right, we do not want to compete. It is a waste of, of resources and money if we do so. Mr. Thomas. In essence, we are both looking for customers, so there's some level of competition. I mean, the city offers additional services in addition to the sewer. You've got the, the police, fire protection, those type of things that come with coming into the city. But in the past, we've done I feel like our part, the city's part for uh, Anwasa, we voluntarily uh, offered them sewer to alleviate their dilemma they had in Springdale out in the southwest area. The state had come down and imposed a moratorium on them where they were going to have to take over a failing plant, but the city stepped up. We've run a line out there to assume that responsibility for Kenwood, those, those type areas, uh, southwest middle school I believe was in the in that area so we are selling to them and they'll be selling to us in the future so we've got a lot of avenues for cooperation again I mentioned earlier uh, we're doing a joint study of aquifers and stuff that are going to benefit all of us Mr. Eatman I'll repeat the question for you um, do you see the city and Owasa competing for the same customers and is this a waste of taxpayers dollars to a degree, yes, they're competing for the same customers, and of course it's a waste of uh, taxpayers' dollars. Whenever you have multiple levels of government on top of each other, it should be working to serve the same citizens. Uh, various enterprise funds like our own water department and then the county's water all through Onwasa uh, trying to beat each other out of getting the very same customers. Uh, that is never going to end well because it is, as you said, just going to be a waste of taxpayers' dollars. Um, as far as what Mr. Warden said about essentially on Wassa and the city of Jacksonville trying to uh, go in one direction and, you know, not really try to compete over there. I think that the city's area of service it should look at are the areas within the city's boundaries. Uh, I don't think that we should necessarily plan on expanding. I think that any kind of new areas that come along we should deal with uh, as they try to be annexed by the city. I don't think that we should plan on serving other areas that are not currently within city limits. Mr. Williams. Thank you. I'm sure that there's probably some competition going on. I'm not aware of uh, what competition for customers might be out there right now. But it's another opportunity for the city and another uh, agency to get along well and, and play well. You know, we learn in uh, early age, you know, that you need to play with your neighbors. And sometimes we forget that lesson all too often. There's no reason why the city and the and Unwasa can't do a competitive agreement with each other to share customers. I see no reason why that can't happen at all. Uh, 
there's certainly people on this uh, board or on this uh, candidate uh, panel right now that have more experience in that. Some of them are on the actual Onwasa board. So I, I would defer to them at this point. Mr. Bittner. Uh, no, to your first part of your question, we are not competing for the same water customers. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, we should not. And I'm on the Onwasa board as a city representative. Onwasa is primarily a water purveyor. 90% of their revenue base is water customers. City is much different. We provide water and sewer service. To that end, we have partnered with Onwasa, as Mr. Warden has said, in the construction of a new sewer line under construction now on the almost the entirety of Piney Green Road. That'll provide sewer service to a lot of Onwasa customers that are now uh, having septic problems. At the same time, the city has some land out there that's going to be developed and we'll be able to provide sewer service and water service to those people as well. Uh, and as Mr. Warren also mentioned, we're partnering with a joint study with the base with Onwasa of a study of the aquifer. There's primarily only one aquifer we all get our water from and we have to make sure that we manage that effectively to prevent saltwater intrusion. And we're working like that with Onwasa Thank as a you. partnership. Okay. All right. Uh, so now we'll go to, um, we will go to Mr. Thomas. And I will ask him, and I, are there any cards first? I need to recognize that. Okay, here we I'm go. <laughs> You're out of cards, but you just talked. <laughs> okay, here's the question. Um, how would you how would you, would you describe your philosophy on matters related to the municipal budget and government spending in general? Well, my philosophy has been, and my practice has been to thoroughly examine the budget, to try to know as much about the budget as anybody on the council. I take the budget books home. I request additional information. I've gone through multiple years of 500, 600 page details of the budget. I'm not going to agree with everything in the budget, but I am going to ask. And I think sometimes just asking helps convey your, your preferences. We have, in the past four, five, six years, leveled, had a level budget, more or less within a 5% range since about 2007, since I've been here. We've been about a $44, $45 million budget. We have accomplished a lot of great things through our <coughs> adoption of the three E's, efficient, effective, economical government. Uh, we've had a lot of changes in the past six years with a sustainable budget. Okay, thank you. Mr. Eatman? Well, as someone who uh, studied accounting, I'm very much a budget kind of guy. I love running through those. I was looking at the city's capital improvement plan. We've got about $70 million worth of capital projects. We're going to be um, initiating between this year and 2017. About half of that is financed with debt. I dislike debt. I dislike long-term debt especially. Um, I saw that the uh, public safety headquarters building is going to be financed with debt payable over a period of 20 years with a useful life of 30 years. Uh, there are other structures such as sewer lines that will be paid off over 20 years and their useful life is only 20 years. I think that we should try to have more uh, bang for our buck, so to speak. Uh, when I look at, for example, Buckingham Palace, that's been up uh, a little bit longer than 20 or 30 years. Surely we can come up with some kind of way to make the city's uh, own structures last a little bit more than uh, how long it takes us to pay off that uh, amount for them. Mr. Williams. Thank you. I'm not an accounting manager, but I am a uh, a thorough studier of the budget and I did take a look at the budget. One of the first things I saw in the budget and, and I recognize that the, this year's budget was severely hampered by uh, the uh, cut that the county took in sales tax that uh, we had to go scrambling for uh, a few million dollars. One of the things I saw on there was the four million dollars that was going to, uh, to uh, Sturgeon City and I questioned that until I was able to go out and get a little bit of information on it. I think a philosophy on the budget uh, like uh, Mr. Thomas was saying, is that you have to study it. You have to be a good student of what is in the budget in order to make logical and, and uh, good decisions with regards to it. 
I don't agree with everything in the budget as well. But I think the philosophy is you should have a balanced budget. You need to strive every year to have a balanced budget, and that means keeping your spending limits within the limits that you establish every year. That's the reason we do budgets. Thank you. Mr. Bittner? I want to make sure I respond correctly to the question. Repeat it, please. Yeah. How would you describe your philosophy on matters that are related to the municipal budget and, uh, and government spending in general? Well, I think this council, and I'm part of this council, is basically fiscal conservative. And we're following that philosophy without trying to thwart the progress by zeroing in on, as uh, Mr. Thompson says, efficiencies, effectiveness, and economies. Our staff has followed that philosophy and what it means in, for things like combination, combining the police and fire departments, uh, new positions, or a, any position becomes vacant now, rather than just automatically filling that, the staff goes through a re-justification to make sure other people can't pick up on that workload. Do we need a full-time position for that? Examine all the wares and withalls for that particular position without before deciding to fill it. So these are the kind of things we're practicing because quite frankly, we're facing a, some severe financial problems next year with the loss of the sales tax, the cutbacks in the military, the effects of the revaluation uh, re for the county. We're going to have to even do some further belt tightening to avoid any tax increases because the taxpayers are carrying enough of a burden right now. They don't need to carry any more taxes. Thank you. Mr. Warden. I think you always have to have the uh, uh, greet each budget with a little bit of skepticism uh, as you look through it because you've got to be questioning, you've got to be digging uh, through the budget. There's always, there's always the issue of ne really never enough resources to pay for all your wants. So you have to make sure that first you take care of your needs. Um, one of the gentlemen here said that uh, we had plenty of property tax uh, to pay for all the things. Our property taxes really only cover our water, I mean, excuse me, our police and fire. That's all the property taxes cover. So we have to look for other ways of, of generating revenue for, uh, for the, all the other services that we provide. Uh, the water and sewer is, is self-sufficient, uh, but the parks and recreation, for example, is not community development. There are a lot of city functions that are not funded through the property tax system. So we use sales tax, we use uh, user fees. So there's always uh, a, a need to look at what's coming in versus what's going out and decide what's important. Thank you. Any cards? Okay. Just, All right, we got one 15-second card. I just wanted to mention that uh, a balanced budget in municipal government is, is not especially a philosophy. It's a legislatively mandated requirement from the state. So we will have a balanced budget no matter what. Okay, and I, we've got time for about two more questions. I'm going to start this question with Mr. Eatman and move back down the table. And then I'm going to, Mr. Williams will have the uh, honor of answering the last question first, and we'll move back down and go from there. So um, my question to you, Mr. Eatman, is this. Is the Surgeon City project worth the resources being expended on it, and what do you see as the future of that project going forward? I'm not so familiar with the Sturgeon City project. I think that any kind of spending that the government does, we need to go out physically to the area and see what's being done, not just looking at the budget itself. Um, I know that the city's been putting in quite a bit of money to that. Is all of it justified? More than likely, I would say that there's some room for change uh, in relation to the budget, but um, I wouldn't say that we should cut it out uh, completely right away. Okay, Mr. Thomas, I'll repeat the question. Um, is the Sturgeon City project worth the resources that are being expended on it, and what do you see as the future of that project? Uh, to be clear, the general fund expenditures for the Sturgeon City project is are $75,000 per year at this point. Obviously, we lease the land, the property. As far as the ultimate answer to that, I don't think I know. I'm hopeful that it will be. It's, uh, it's got a lot of potential for use by the citizens, uh, other outside events, possibly. 
it's a worthwhile project as far as the ultimate net. Only time will tell. Mr. Ward. As uh, Mr. Thomas mentioned, uh, the general fund that the property taxpayers in, in Jacksonville are only paying about 75000 What we've done is created or helped help Sturgeon City create an, a nonprofit board of directors. And they are responsible for the planning. They are responsible for the uh, architect that's, that they're currently working with. They're responsible for raising money. So we are trying uh, to wean ourselves away from Sturgeon City financial uh, expense. The, as people may remember, the Sturgeon City was actually developed in response to the pollution that the city was, was doing by, by sending our sewer out into Wilson Bay. We killed Wilson Bay from, from an aquatic life standpoint. Uh, through Sturgeon City, uh, researchers from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, NC State, they've come in and they've, they've uh, initiated programs that have helped clean up Wilson Bay and really uh, brought new life back into the New River as a whole. Thank you. Mr. Bittner. I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Ward. In Sturgeon City, I support it. I think it has a chance of being a science and education center for all the kids in North Carolina, uh, school children. We have people coming from across the state now to visit what exists there in terms of the aquatic center and so on. It has the potential of being really a bonus for this community and to me, it's an investment in what I think Sturgeon City can be, and it's proven our justification in terms of what is done to improve the quality of the new river. Mr. Williams. Thank you. As I mentioned in my uh, previous answer with regards to the, the budget, on Sturgeon City, uh, we are taking, uh, although maybe there's only 75000 that are going from there, I think we've got a capital improvement program that we put $4 million into the program this year out of our budget. So there was a significant impact from this year's budget going forward. It's been explained to me that in future years that that's the only one that's going to happen. Now, is that a bad thing? I'm not necessarily in favor of using government money for private funds giving them out, doling them out. I understand in some instances that can have a five-fold return on the investment that you do. But in a general sense, I'm not in favor of using government funds to fund private uh, enterprises. Uh, the uh, universities that have projects out there, I understand, are doing very well, that they've had some significant uh, research done out there, and it will ultimately benefit us in the long run. We have a 15-second rebuttal card from Mr. Warden. Uh, just, just to be clear to the viewers, the $4 million is the expected cost of the first phase of construction. The debt on that is roughly $350,000 or $300,000 a year, of which the city is, is currently paying the $75,000 that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So it's not actually $4 million out of pocket. Okay. Now we're going to move to um, Mr. Williams for our last round of questions. You'll be first up, and we will move... Um, to my left and your right. Many people have been affected by changes in the housing markets in Jacksonville, um, from negative impacts on property values to lengthy delays in home sales. What, if anything, can the City Council do to help homeowners uh, hold on to their investment? I don't think the city should be doing much to uh, help the homeowners uh, hold on to their investment. Again, it's a uh, against my philosophy to use public dollars for private enterprises. Uh, everyone is suffering through this downturn. The house right next to me has been in foreclosure for a few months now. It's been vacant for over a year. As I walk around the neighborhoods out there, I see a number of houses that are in foreclosure. When I knock on the door or open up the screen door and see that there's a foreclosure notice pinned to the door, you know, I'm probably not going to get a vote from that area. One of the things that I've noticed, though, is that we continue to build houses, and we continue to build houses, and we continue to build houses. And as long as we continue to build houses and we're, if we're overbuilding, right now I believe we have about a, a 10 to a 20 percent vacancy rate in housing. As long as that occurs, we're never going to be able to get around the curve. Thank you. Mr. Bittner? I wish I had the answer to that question. I feel for the homeowners who paid 
a certain sum for their homes and now find that with the market is changing and the economics being what they are that they've lost value uh, I don't know what the city can do with that except trying to stimulate our economy by creating a better job atmosphere bringing in industry and we've tried that so many times but we can't quit trying to do that uh, we can do our best by making sure we keep taxes as low as possible. Thank you. Mr. Warden. <clears throat> Very sympathetic to, to those who are undergoing uh, foreclosure problems, who are having trouble selling their house, who are having trouble renting their house. It's, it's really not, a, not, not good for Jacksonville. It's not good for Onslow County. Unfortunately, uh, there's really not much we can do. The free market enterprise that, uh, that America was founded upon is what drives that sort of thing. And, and Mr. Williams is right. We continue to build. The basis, for example, has built, uh, is, is going to build somewhere around 900 more houses than what they've torn down. This during a time when it looks like they're going to be cutting back military folks on board base. Uh, we've certainly got an overabundance of, of apartments here in town. We've got an overabundance of, of houses. Uh, but again, that private development, private enterprise, um, I don't think the city should be telling private folks whether they should or should not be building. They're just going to have to, those folks that are building are going to have to learn the lesson about uh, the way free, free market works. Mr. Thomas? Uh, when I came on the council in 2007, I remember the big hullabaloo was about the 202K buildup that we were being told that all these new people were coming to Jacksonville and it was out across the nation. So uh, it, it's been a blessing and a curse. I mean, we, the nation obviously took a terrible downturn economically that Jacksonville did not suffer. Therein we were, became attractive to larger builders that didn't exist in this town maybe 2005 and seven. So when there was no activity anywhere else in the country and they saw growth, they have come to Jacksonville. You can only do so much. The, to make it more desirable to live in Jacksonville, to move, relocate here, we have to try to continue to keep expenses low, to make it an affordable, enjoyable, pleasurable place to live that people want to live because they can afford it. Unfortunately, we do have some rough times ahead. Mr. Eatman. And could you repeat the question? Sure. Many people have been affected by changes in the housing markets in Jacksonville, um, from negative impacts on property values to lengthy delays in home sales. What, if anything, can the city council do to uh, help homeowners hold on to their investment? Well, it's been said before that the government shouldn't have a hand in that kind of thing. Um, if you buy an investment, if you buy Coca-Cola stock and suddenly like Coca-Cola tanks, who's going to bail you out for that? We shouldn't expect the government to start bailing people out uh, for investments. I think that in a home in particular is an uh, investment made specifically for whoever's buying that in that they will no longer have to pay rent. They should take care of that particular home that they uh, buy. Um, that I think is what we're going to see mostly in this town is people trying to buy houses, especially with uh, housing prices going down in recent years. I think that that's a good thing. I think that the put, putting home ownership firmly within the grasp of people now is not in any way a bad thing. Whenever people can finally afford something that they need, like food or water or shelter, that's in no way a bad thing. I think that we should let the economy do whatever it wants. And right now, we're having, as we have for years, a uptick in uh, private construction of apartment buildings in this city. I say let it go. OK, well, that, uh, that concludes our round of general questions. Um, what I'll do now is we'll start with the, let me ask if there's, this is a last chance rebuttal, uh, rebuttal card uh, opportunity here. Um, but let me move on then with the summations. And what I will do is start with Mr. Warden and we'll go through the, uh, go to your left, uh, actually to your right. Yeah, there we go, that right. And, uh, and, and go through the at-large candidates. And then we'll start after that with Mr. Bittner and go to Mr. Williams um, for our Ward 2 candidates. 
So, Mr. Warden. Uh, ten minutes, is that what you You've got, uh, <laughs> you can talk for ten minutes, but I'm going to cut you off after one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed being here tonight, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to reach out to those folks who, who perhaps don't know me. Uh, if you know me, you know uh, what I stand for. You know that family is very important to me, and I want to continue to make Jacksonville a place to raise your family, a good place to raise your family. Um, I've I always believed that you get back what you put in. I've enjoyed my my years of service to the citizens of Jacksonville. I I can tell you that I've gotten much more out of it than than I've given. Uh, for what little bit I've given, I, I'm grateful that uh, you saw me saw me saw fit to elect me for four years. I certainly would like another four years, maybe not because I deserve it, but because. I want to, to continue to serve the, the citizens of Jacksonville. This is my hometown. I love it and want to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Um, looking back on what the town was like when I first came on, it, it, it's such a transformation. I can remember going around town seeing uh, trash thrown behind Walmart, just you know, high grass in the middle of the streets. Um, and, and it's come around. It's really improved. People tell me all the time the appearance of Jacksonville is a lot better than it has been in the past. Again, that's uh, a reflection of the emphasis of the council, the uh, efforts of the staff. As far as the city government itself, it's been transformed, uh, transformed over the past six years. We, when I came on, we had an assistant finance director. We had an assistant utility director, uh, assistant I can't remember, but when those positions were vacated, they were not filled. We have a much leaner staff. Again, we've done more with the same resources. I've thoroughly enjoyed serving and I'm honored to work with the council that we have now and hope to continue that work. Thank you. Mr. Eatman. I've talked to a number of citizens all over town. I've been hearing the kind of things that they're saying, uh, some of them such as building crosswalks, the city has recently begun to do those things. I think that it would be a little bit better, though, if the city council started doing these things in a more timely fashion. I think also that we need to have elected representatives that take a stance firmly against things like property tax increases and against things like eminent domain. Uh, I said before that Jacksonville Landing is built on the site or will be built on the site if it ever does get built uh, where there used to be three businesses and right now there is no Jacksonville Landing uh, to stimulate our economy. Um, I think that the city can best serve the people of Jacksonville and its business climate by staying out of business but by staying in the social circles by actually communicating with the city residents. I'd like a chance to serve on the city council to best represent the interests of the people of the city of Jacksonville. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bittner. Thank you. Well, I've been a resident of Jacksonville for 26 years and I feel I know most of the people. They know me. They know that I love this community and take pride in what's been accomplished. I can remember what Court Street was many years ago and what it's come about to be today. We've made significant progress. We made progress in building Jacksonville into an economic center. I can recall when Western Boulevard Extension was only a dream of Matt Ray's father and working with him and other private developers and getting the state to partner with private development to extend that road and see all the businesses that have developed and helped our residents and tax base by doing so. I'm running for election for a multitude of reasons. But I, it simply boils down that I believe my experience in government, my knowledge of the community, having a military background puts me in a position where I think I can make positive contributions by serving as your representative. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you. My objective for running for city council is onefold. It's to give the citizens of Jacksonville a choice in government, a choice in candidates. All I can do is run. It's up to the citizens of Jacksonville to get out and make the vote. 
One of the things that I found very disturbing as I was going out and, and doing my research is that about a 2 to 6 percent turnout in municipal years for elections. That's deplorable. Each one of us have a right and a privilege to vote in elections. We're one of the few countries in the world that have that. I think everyone that has the ability and has the right and has the privilege needs to be out there and voting, whether you vote for me or you vote for one of these other candidates. I'd like to thank all the other candidates for their service, not only to the service of the country, but also service to the city. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, candidates, I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, adhering to the rules and uh, and for providing such an informative evening. I've always been impressed by people that will uh, will show up here and take on these questions sight unseen. And uh, thanks for the thanks for your efforts tonight. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Lorette Legan of the. Jacksonville Unsolved Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. And let's give Elliot Potter a round of applause. He's an excellent moderator. Very well done. Again, I would like to thank our sponsors of tonight's event, Duke Energy and the Daily News, and of course our partners here at the City of Jacksonville and the City of Jacksonville Media Services. And to uh, Council Members Thompson, Warden, and Bittner, Thank you for your service. I know the hours and the hours and the sacrifices your family makes. That's Thomas. Thomas, oh, new girl in town again. Thank you, Randy. I'll just say Randy for now on. And Mr. Williams, Mr. Eaton, I admire you for stepping up and willing to be um, on this ballot. And the best to everyone in November. Thank you.